Coming up on this week's show, we take a time trip to the Regency with Cat Sebastian. Welcome to the Big Gay Fiction Podcast, the show for readers and writers of gay romance fiction. If you can read it, write it, watch it, or listen to it, these two guys are going to talk about it. Now, here are your hosts, Jeff Adams and Will Knaus. Welcome to episode 92 of Jeff and Will's Big Gay Fiction Podcast. I'm Jeff from jeffadamswrites.com. And I'm Will from willcanals.com. This week's episode is sponsored in part by viewers just like you. We'll have more information on how you can help support the show in just a few minutes. Yes. Uh, welcome to another episode. Woohoo! And congratulations. To us. You can't see if you're just listening, but he's making a cute little face over here right now. <laughs> yes, congratulations to us. Let's pat ourselves on the back. Yes. Um, this week we managed to submit our co-written manuscript. Woohoo! So there you go. Yeah. Now we wait and see what happens. Yeah. Uh, the waiting game uh, begins. Um, do you want to... Uh, I don't know. Do you... I, you, you feel good about the submission? I do. I think it's no secret we've been writing a category romance. Uh, I feel confident in it since... I mean, I really view you as the as our, our guru on category between the two of us because you've read many more than I have. Um, I think it's a good story category or otherwise. And, yeah, I feel as confident in it as I do about anything else that I've been submitting over time, so... We wait and we see, and, you know, if it comes back, accept it, awesome. And if it doesn't, we'll decide what to do with it from there. Because mm-hmm. I, I think it's viable to, to, some, to, to any degree, you know, whether or not it meets the exact specifications of what we submitted for. Yes. So, I still say yeah, yes. Because <laughs> we wrote a book together. Woo! <laughs> Hopefully the first of, of at least two more to come. <laughs> yes. Many more. Many more. Uh, Want to give some congrats to our winners. Uh, Katie and Lisa uh, were both winners and got the first two ebooks in the California comedy series from Jason T. Gaffney and Ed Gaffney. And do you want to do the next one? Uh, let me see if I can read this. Uh, congratulations to Kylie, who won the signed arc of Some Kind of a Hero from Suzanne Brockman. Yeah, and thanks to Suzanne, Jason, and Ed for offering up those groovy prizes to the folks. Yeah. Um, we should note this week, one of, uh, at least my favorite musicals, because you've actually never seen it, yep. uh, Falsettos, uh, the Tony-nominated revival, is playing in select movie theaters on Wednesday, July 12th, uh, in a performance that was originally recorded for PBS's Live from Lincoln Center. Uh, this hilarious and poignant look at a modern family revolving around the life of a gay man, Marvin, his wife, his lover, and his soon-to-be Mar Mitford son, along with their psychiatrist and the lesbian next door, is a hoot. And also very, very uh, heartwarming and heartrending at the same time. Um, I've not seen this particular production. The cast recording is amazing. I've seen a staging of the show once. It's awesome. Uh, I'm hoping to drag this one to see it in L.A. next week because we're down there and a screening is nearby. If you want to find out if there's a screening near you and they are all over the place, uh, go to falsettosincinema.com for a list of locations and showtimes. And there's some theaters will actually have additional screenings during the week as well if Wednesday evening doesn't work for you. So there you go. So part of why we are in L.A. next week is we're going to Outfest on Saturday, July 15th for the screenings of something like Summer and Eastsiders. Uh, if you happen to be going to either one of those, definitely, you know, find us and say hello. And keep an eye on the Big Gay Fiction Podcast Facebook page uh, that particular day, because it's possible we'll do some video and photo uploads from that event. And that's facebook.com slash biggayfictionpodcast. Awesome. Yeah. We want to give a big thank you and a shout out to our newest patrons, Kendra and CJ. Hi, Kendra. Hi, CJ. Now, as always, you can help support the Big Gay Fiction Podcast with a monthly pledge through Patreon. For as little as 25 cents an episode, your pledge helps pay for the cost of producing and just. Dis- Distributing this podcast. Now, for fans who pledge at the silver and gold levels, you'll have the exclusive opportunity to ask questions of our upcoming guests. And it's also worth noting that we have decided to uh, extend the special thank yous mm-hmm. for Pride Month 
for the whole year, frankly. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, if you happen to join us on Patreon, pa- pa- oh goodness gracious, Patreon, Patreon, or Patreon, who knows? Whatever. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that place. If you go to that place, if you choose to support us through Patreon. Uh, and would like to receive a very special thank you, a personal thank you from the two of us, all you have to do is give us your home address. Now, if you aren't comfortable doing that, you certainly don't have to. It is not a a requirement of patronage. No. No. Uh, But uh, also worth noting, uh, we are the only two people in the whole wide world who will ever see that address. It's true. But the postman will, but... Well, well, I will hope he would see that address so he could deliver it. So three people. There are three people who will ever see that address. So uh, if you would like to receive a very special thank you for joining us and our patron family on Patreon.com, all you have to go, all you have to do is go to Patreon.com forward slash Big Gay Fiction Podcast. Good job. Yeah. Yeah. That was okay. I, I know. <laughs> and certainly that, that offer is good for if you didn't take advantage of the Pride uh, thing back in June and you do want a thank you and some goodies, leave us your address at a private, uh, private message to us and we'll be happy to send that along. Mm-hmm. Did you know that podcasts love to get reviews too? Taking a moment to leave a review about the Big Gay Fiction Podcast helps us with the show's visibility online please take a moment to visit iTunes and leave a review. Your comments help other readers of gay romance discover this show. Thanks for helping us spread the word about the Big Gay Fiction Podcast. So I wanted to start off kind of where we left off in the last episode. We talked about all that theater last episode. Oh, yeah. And there was one show that we didn't get to see that I kind of regret that we didn't, and it's called Come From Away. I uh, kind of got into it uh, when it was on the Tony Awards. I was very into the musicality of it, uh, both the score and the movement and the lyrics. Uh, Come From Away actually tells of a true story that happened on September 11, 2001, when the U.S. airspace closed, 38 planes ended up diverted to Gander, Newfoundland, which is this little teeny tiny place off on the very eastern part of Canada, apparently. Um, and these 38 planes had thousands of people on them. And when these people could finally get off the planes after, I think, more than a day of just having to sit there on those planes, uh, the town of Gander grew, like, twice its size because Gander is only about 9,000 people and there was about 7,000 people on these planes. This musical tells the story of the town of Gander banding together to, you know, render whatever aid was needed, whether it was just, it was clothing, it was a place to stay, it was a place to sleep, it was phones to be able to try and call family. Uh, they really all banded around these uh, people who had come from away uh, and landed in their backyards on that very tragic day. The musical is uplifting and joyous and heartfelt and emotional. I honestly don't know if I could sit in the theater and not just be a ball of emotions during it. Uh, I admit that the the cast album did make me a little weepy, but uh, the story is outstanding. It is told with such heart and such grace. I highly recommend uh, the cast recording. Uh, if I can get back to this musical at some point, if it happens to still be playing in New York next time we're there, or it goes on tour or something, it's definitely top of my list. Uh, I will say, it was never on TKTS while we were in the city. Uh, it's selling that well, even though it did not win any Tonys. Uh, But check out the cast recording if you're interested. You can sample it on iTunes. I'm going to put in the show notes uh, a link to their Tony Award performance from YouTube. Uh, So I highly recommend that. Mm -hmm. Um, Book reviews. Yay, book reviews. Yay, book reviews. So Will reviewed this. You'll recognize the cover if you're on uh, the video. Uh, Ariel Totna's Take Two. Uh, I did the audiobook of this while we traveled uh, to New York a couple weeks ago and loved it. Uh, I'm such a fan of her Lexington Lovers series anyway, and Take Two just keeps going in that same vein. Uh, I won't spend too much time on it because you covered it so well, but just briefly, if you missed uh, his review at episode 90, uh, this book revolves around a high school principal and uh, his former high school crush. Uh, Blake is the principal, and he actually rescues a couple of kids from a bullying situation. 
Uh, but because there were no witnesses to say who started anything, the boys end up on probation and end up working on the stage crew for the high uh, for this uh, high school play that's going on. And Blake's in charge of that. Of course, he has to call their dad, and he figures out in short order that it is his high school crush, Thane, who is now taking care of these boys uh, because his sister passed away. I love how Ariel goes about getting these two moving from uh, kind of bristling against each other to uh, falling in love. Um, I love, this is the second book in a row where she's had uh, children or siblings involved uh, that kind of help bring the primary couple together. And I love how she balances the family aspect of it with bringing two people together into the relationship while considering how these children or siblings kind of play into that. Um, I just, I, I can't talk enough about this book because I loved it. And I love the audio. Uh, the narrator, John Solo, does such a good job. Uh, in, in particular here, not only voicing all the adult characters, but giving the kids uh, a really good uh, characterization as well, I thought. So good job, Ariel. Good job, John. Loved this book. Uh, the other book I've read uh, is uh, V.L. Losey's Point Shot Trilogy. Uh, hockey. Woo! Got to get the hockey in during off-season, of course. Uh, this is actually made up of three individual books, uh, Two Man Advantage, Game Misconduct, and Full Strength. And these three books make up the romance between Victor Kalinsky and Dan Aero. Or Aero? I'm a little confused on how to say that name. Sorry, it's Canadian. Uh, this is all told from Victor's side. He is a rough and tumble hockey guy who gets sent down uh, from Boston to a farm team in upstate New York uh, because he's got anger management issues and he's just, he's basically in a bad mood all the time. Um, but somehow Dan sees him and falls in love with him and Victor actually kind of falls in love with Dan too, but they both initially, they just can't really stand each other in a lot of ways and there's some angry sex and, but it all evolves into this caring relationship over the course of these three books. Uh, it's really kind of delightful how Victor brings out some of the life in Dan and makes him a more well-rounded, happy person. Dan's pretty happy anyway, but somehow Victor lifts him up and makes him even happier. And Dan really smooths off some of Victor's rough edges and makes it where he's a valuable member of this team instead of just being the troublemaker who got dumped on them from, from the higher level in the league. Uh, VL does a great job with all the supporting characters, and in particular, the obstacles that she just keeps throwing at them. Uh, and how they deal with them is really inspired. Um, I think this is a wonderful read. Uh, very uh, price-friendly if you pick it up, even while we're recording the show. I picked it up, I think, for 99 cents on a book bub. But as we're recording uh, here on July 9th, it's only $1.99 on Amazon to get all three books in the box. So check that out if you're into hockey romance. There'll be a link in the show notes for that for sure. So I highly recommend V.L. Losey's uh, Point Shot Trilogy. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Now, you have a book also. I finished a book this week as well. I read The Lawrence Brown Affair by Kat Sebastian. And this is um, the second book in her loosely connected uh, historical trilogy. This particular book uh, focuses on Georgie Turner. He is the brother of Jack Turner, the hero from the last book. And Journey is... J Journey? What? What are you talking about? <laughs> Wait, what? What am I discussing again? Um, Georgie. Georgie uh, is in a bit of a fix in London, uh, and he has to get out of town. So he takes a job. There is a, a country lord, um, and the rumor is that he's a bit mad. So um, Georgie is tasked uh, to going to the middle of nowhere in Cornwall to check in on this guy to just see how cuckoo he might be, uh, all under the guise of being... Uh, his personal secretary. Okay. So Georgie arrives at Penkellis uh, and discovers that the Earl of Radnor, uh, Lawrence Brown, the uh, the uh, guy in the title, uh, <laughs> he discovers that uh, Lawrence is not mad. He's just a bit eccentric, uh, and he's actually a brilliant scientist. Uh, his current project, he is working on the prototype of. Uh, uh, 
oh car I'm totally what's what's the word I want to use a uh, telegraph uh, a very early prototype of a telegraph is what he's working on uh, so Georgie sets to work uh, cleaning up his office and his papers and helping uh, helping him uh, with his experiments he also helps get the house back in order um, Georgie also can't help being attracted uh, to the Lord because he's big and burly and he has wild crazy hair and a big bushy beard and who wouldn't be into that Indeed. Uh, <laughs> and Lawrence is actually quite taken with Georgie because he's uh, handsome and he's charming and he's actually uh, surprisingly intelligent for you know someone who's just you know shows up out of nowhere and says hey I'm gonna be your secretary <laughs> anyway so they do their experiments and they get to know one another uh, and of course they end up uh, falling for one of another. Uh, there are also complications. Um, Lawrence's young son from a doomed marriage years earlier shows up. He's a, like a little Lord Fauntleroy type. Uh, there's also strange shenanigans going on in Cornwall. Uh, somewhere on the property there's some uh, 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 untoward shenanigans going on uh also some relatives show up and that's not too good um uh, georgie has to uh flee uh because his past catches up with him uh all sorts of uh great stuff happens um as in the previous book i really uh love cat's characterizations of, of these two gentlemen uh, both have issues with trust, uh, and by working together in this sort of moldy old manner out in the middle of Cornwall, they uh, fall in love, and it's just remarkable. I love this book to pieces, and I can't re recommend it enough. Very cool. It's interesting. I was in the in the pre-recording uh, talking to Cat. Um, I told her how we kept hearing about Soldier Scoundrel, you mm -hmm. know, very early on. That everybody was like, "Oh, if you read this book, if you read this book." And it was like, I, it was the book I didn't know I needed, mm -hmm. you know, because I really enjoyed that. And I look forward to, to taking that one on, too. Uh, talking to Kat was awesome. Uh, she was a lot of fun. We talked about her, how, why the Regency is where she wants to write and how she tries to draw realistic mm -hmm. LGBTQ characters for the time. Yeah. While still making sure that they're allowed to have their happily ever after. They fully acknowledge the 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 obstacles of society around them, but they're still going to go for their happily ever after anyway. Um, shall we talk to Cat? Yes, let's let let's let's do so. Let's do so. So today I'm welcoming Cat Sebastian to the podcast. Cat writes steamy, upbeat historical romances that usually take place in the Regency, have at least one LGBTQ plus main character, and always have happy endings. She lives in a swampy part of the South with her husband, three kids, and two dogs. Before her kids were born, she practiced law and taught high school and college writing. When she is reading or writing, she's doing crossword puzzles, bird watching, and wondering where she put her coffee cup. Welcome, Kat. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's great to have you here. Uh, Will and I have both been enjoying your books quite a bit. Uh, in fact, That's as we record hear. this, Ruin of a Rake just dropped into our Kindle this morning, which is Yay. awesome. That's great. Uh, now, you've described Ruin of a Rake as your take on the rake versus wallflower trope. Tell us some more yes. about this book. Well, that was what I initially I thought, like, I wanted to do a fake relationship plot because that's such a staple of romance, like not just historical romance, but romance in general. Um, so I wanted to think of, like, how would you have a fake relationship in the Regency between two men? And so I thought that maybe if one of them had sort of been strong armed to help rehabilitate the relationship, uh, rehabilitate the reputation of the other one, I thought that could work. Um, but then the but then like as I was writing it, that that aspect of it seemed like it didn't that that didn't really make it to the forefront. And so what I really was left with was my wallflower character turned out to usually you would expect the wallflower to be like. A sweetheart like a nice like a nice at least like baseline niceness and julian is not like he's insensitive and cold and rude and i have never ever had so much fun writing a character <laughs> like that 
Um, and so he sort of, I mean, like he sort of took off, like, you know, the Courtney, the rake is relatively decent. You know, he does not get up to much raking over the course of the book, unless it's with Julian. And, um, really it's, it turned out to be a different story than what I had, what I had planned on, which is like, which is always nice as a writer when that happens, you know, when you're like, Oh, like my initial plan was okay, but that's not, that's not the story that I had to tell. Mm -hmm. And it sort of took on a life of its own. Was there any particular inspiration for this book or was it just wanting to go down the path of the, of the rake wallflower? It was like the rake wallflower and then the idea of their, of the rake being sort of a minor celebrity where he was well known enough that somebody could have written a Romana Clef about his life and that, and for that to cause him major problems. Like I sort of like that idea because it happened to Byron, you know, um, and it's happened to other people, especially queer people, you know, throughout history. And I sort of wanted to play with that notion, mm-hmm. but that's a really vague, like vague, like way that's like secondary tertiary level inspiration, <laughs> but it works. So that's, what's important. Get, I hope so. To get, the, know, to get the things flowing. Yes. Exa- yeah, exactly. Exactly. Now, this is your third LGBTQ plus Regency in less than a year. Cause it was only in September that soldier yeah, scoundrel no. came out. And, right. and it's your third book overall as an author. What brought you into writing this particular genre? I should probably start out by saying that I had never written anything at all until I was 35. Um, like, at all. Like, I hadn't written a short story. I had maybe written a couple of half-baked blog posts. But... Um, after my younger kids, their twins, were born, I had really, really bad postpartum depression. And so I started binge reading historical romance. Like, it was just, like, medicinal doses of historical romance. And, uh, like, we're talking, like, a book a day. Just pure escapism. Just, like, just opening my veins and, like, dumping in, like, Julia Quinn and, like, Lisa Klebus. And, um, and it was hugely satisfying to just read happy stories. Like, it works out. Like, no matter what happens, it works out. And, like, when you are at rock bottom, it is super validating to see other people who go through hell and make it out alive. Um, and then when my life was kind of resembling normal and my kids were, like, in preschool and kindergarten age, I found myself with... Like, like what felt like a crazy amount of time on my hands, you know, like I have a couple of hours to myself every day. And so I said, you know, what? Like maybe I'll try, I'll try writing a romance. And I tried and it was, you know, predictably very, very bad. And it didn't, it didn't, that one will never see the light of day. But then I had been, I had been reading, um, I had moved on to reading a lot of Jordan Hawk and KJ Charles. And also I had reread Ellen Kushner's Swords Point. So I had all of these like historical queer people in my mind. And I said, maybe this, maybe this is the story that I want to tell. And that was the soldier scoundrel, you know. That's really tremendous. I, I think that gives... I would hope that gives inspiration to people in our audience who are like, I want, I feel like there's a story of me to put out there and that they, that they go for it. Uh, Cause certainly with soldier scoundrel, as we talked a little bit about before we started recording, that book came out and suddenly we were hearing about it from uh, bookstore owners that we talked to and from our contributors who are on the show recommending books. That book, you know, turned up everywhere for us in the fall. Um, and it's it's awesome to see that a debut novel can just make that splash. And like, and, which is like super like that just like makes that just, you know, like my heart grows three sizes whenever I hear that. Right. Um, but like it also isn't I feel like when we talk about, you know, do I have a novel in me or that kind of thing? We're usually talking about something that's personal, like a personal novel and Soldier Scoundrel totally is not like it is just a story that I told you know what I mean like it's a story that I told 
like with like later on, like with Lawrence Brown and um and like definitely in The Rune of the Rake, you know, like I feel like I have like that's more those stories are more personal to me. But Soldier Scoundrel was like a fun story that I wanted to write and that I said like to hell with it. Like I don't I have no idea if there's a market for like really tropey gay regencies, but like whatever. I'm gonna write it, gonna submit it to agents, see what happens. And, um, and, and like I said, I really hadn't written before that. And so I had, I didn't even really know whether what I was writing was like readable, you know, you know, (laughs) like, but, but I have been delighted that it has, but that people have liked it. Like that's extremely gratifying for me. I'm an oldest child and I really like head pats, you know, so it works out. (laughs) It works out really, really well. (laughs) What was the turnaround time from, from finishing uh, soldier scoundrel until you you know were picked up by an agent and then by Avon. Oh. So, I started writing it in June of 2015, and I wrote it in like three months, and then submitted. I had an agent by the end of October, I think. So, like it was, I just did it fast. Looking back, that's that's bananas. I don't know how I did that, but um, but. And then after I signed on with my agent, she wanted me to do a rewrite, like nothing really heavy, but she wanted me to make, she wanted like the pages needed to turn faster, you know, Mm -hmm. like there needed to be like the pacing was off in the book. And so she wanted me to do a rewrite and that took a while. Like that took like another month or so. And then by March I was signed with Avon. So it was, I mean like it was pretty quick. And by then I had already written another book. I had written another book. I had thought that that would be, but that like while I was doing revisions and waiting for my agent to submit it, I wrote a totally different kind of book. I wrote like, I wrote, it wasn't male, male. It was, um, it was, it's male non-binary. Mm. And that, that book actually got picked up by Avon too. And that's going to come out next spring. Oh, that's so, amazing. So yeah, I know. Right. Like I was like, I was totally not expecting I was not expecting Avon to be cool with that story at all and they they like and I I I had sort of pitched it as you know it could be a girl dressed as boy trope like it is a girl dressed as boy trope but the thing is that when she's dressed as a when when this girl is dressed as a boy she has like a moment of realizing this is what like this is her the way this is how she will express her gender like it feels true to her Mm-hmm. And um, and I was, I was expecting Avon to say like maybe lean away from that, and my editor said no, like lean into that. And so I'm I have been consistently delighted by how queer Avon likes books, you mm-hmm. know, like because they're a big five publisher, you know, you yeah. expect them to want to, but like they, but you know, like they recognized a market for it, and they have been. They have been all in, which has been delightful. And my editor in particular is just like a joy. So, yeah. Is the non-binary also going to be set in Regency? Yeah, totally. I'm, wow. I'm all in with I'm all in with Regency. <laughs> it's it's one of the time periods I know anything about, so I I feel like I ought to exploit my knowledge there. Mm-hmm. You know, um, yeah, it'll be Regency. Do you find it? I guess I'll go with difficult to set male, male, or even uh, non-binary gender in a time frame where that wasn't really accepted. I mean, there's a little bit in Soldier Scoundrel, you know, where right. there's the ongoing discussion of, you know, we can't live like this. Right, right. Well, there's always going to be, like, I don't want to dis. I don't ever want to trivialize the real threat that people had you know like people were like especially I mean if you're we all obviously know about like what happened with Oscar Wilde later on like he was literally sent to jail right but people were pilloried people were um people were hanged and transported like during the time period I'm writing about and like yes the characters that I'm writing about probably do have resources or money enough to finagle their way out of any kind of prosecution but that threat is that threat is still there. So I want to make sure that 
when I'm writing their story, they don't expose themselves to risk. And I also want to make sure that their happy ending encompasses a way for them to be secret and safe. Mm -hmm. And for some people that is not going to read happy, like that's, you know, like for some people that is just not going to be enough. Like they, that the, the need for secrecy is a deal breaker. And I totally, I respect that. Like for some people that's going to feel like vaguely traumatic, you know, but, um, but the fact is that history is filled with same sex couples and non-binary people who had happy lives, but we don't necessarily know about it because they kept their secrets really well and because after they died, their loved ones burned their letters. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like I was joking with somebody on Twitter recently, like whenever I hear about someone having burnt letters, like after they died, I'm like, queer person, like we have a fellow queer, like that's that's what it is, you know? And, um, and because that's what you would have to do is like, you would have to make sure your tracks were well covered. So I am, um, I have no idea what question started us here, but like, but I, I feel like I want to, I want to honor that, like that tension between like secrecy and the happy ending, mm-hmm. you know, the need for caution and the happy ending. So that's a balance that I try to strike. Mm-hmm. And you answered that question perfectly. So Yay. good job. <laughs> Hooray. <laughs> so we've got a question from one of our patrons. Uh, okay. Now, Ellen's a little concerned this might be spoilerish. Okay. So if you don't want to answer, you get to opt out. Awesome. But she's curious about the inspiration for the character of Eleanor Standish in Lawrence Brown okay. Affair. And is curious if Lady Standish is based on any real life historical figures, you know, perhaps any of the women scientists of the day who, you know, had to hide their genius behind men. So, first of all, it's not spoilerish at all because Eleanor is in Rune of a Rake and she has a pretty significant part in it because she's Julian Medlock's sister. And so the cat's out of the bag there. Um, Now, she's not inspired by any particular woman, although there were women scientists at the time who were working alongside either husbands or brothers. And uh, I can't think of anyone who like Eleanor did pretend like was operating on her own and just assigning all of her discoveries to a husband who may or may not have known about it. Um, But it's the kind of thing where you wouldn't necessarily know, you know, like that's something that would have been, that would have been concealed And my critique partner, who is a geologist and just a big fan of historical science ladies, said that the only way you could find out would be by looking to see which men in that time period only started making discoveries after they were married, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And I have to imagine that somebody's tried to do that, and I haven't heard about it, you know, but... So in in short, no, there's no particular woman that Eleanor is based on. However, what she's doing, which is like she's doing science and it's under a male name that would have been typical, except that the guy would have been around and present and also a scientist. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, like a partnership, we'll call it. I like that she, so. struck, out, that she is struck out on her own and, you know, just making that work. I mean, you see that, we've seen that a lot in, in fiction over the years. Uh, yeah. Of the woman, yeah. the woman who has to, you know, have the male kind of, and even in, you know, even in the real world, I mean, you look at JK Rowling trying to be not a woman for a while. Right. With right. Harry Potter. Yes, exactly. Like the male pseudonym is, um, is a big deal, you know, um, for credibility and all of that. So for sure. Yeah. So you touched a little bit on what attracted you to the Regency because you mentioned it's a time period that you actually know about. Um, but yes. But kind of what else makes you want to build build your stories in that world as compared to contemporary or anything else that's out there? Well, 
the um so the this like really short period of time the regency like from 18 basically 1810 to 1820 is the setting for so many historical romances probably because that's when Jane Austen was writing but also because it was when Georgette Hare who basically invented historical romance is when she set her stories so it has the advantage of built-in world building where historical romance readers already know the basics of the time period and you can get right down to storytelling without spending much time on history lessons and you don't have to even be tempted to do an info dump or anything like that um but also since we've seen this time period in so many romance novels and bbc miniseries and all that And generally, people in them are all straight, cis, white, able-bodied, and rich. Writing writing in that time period is a chance to sort of populate this very familiar version of the past with, like, real people, okay? Like, to go back and say, queer people have always been here. Like, we've always been here. Disabled people have always been here. Um, And... Like, I personally find that super validating to make these stories that are set in a familiar version of the past, but that are filled with people whose stories have been erased from the past. So I find that super satisfying. Mm -hmm. What's your process for writing? From deciding on the tropes you want to put into a certain story to plotting it to, you know, researching whatever historical points that you need? Um, I usually start with a concept. Like for The Soldier Scoundrel, I knew I wanted to write about a Regency era fixer. And I went from there and like he was the, like Jack the fixer was who I knew I needed. And then I paired him with like the last person on earth that he would ever want to fall for or even spend time with or even think about. And, um, And then from there, like from that pairing, I gave them a plot that would expose all of their weaknesses, like all of their prejudices. Um, And that's basically how I did Lawrence Brown, too, where I started with a concept. In that case, it was Beauty and the Beast. And then I filled in the the plot details as I went. As far as historical research, like for me, like I do it all. Like I try not to bog myself down with it until the second draft. Like I get out the story, like get out the, the character and the like the bones of the story, I get it out. And then when I go back, I find that I've left myself like a thousand notes. Like when do stagecoach, like where's the stagecoach going, you know, like, or um, how long does it take to get to York? Like, or, um, or like, you know, what kind of boots would he be wearing? That sort of thing. And I fill that in like later on, like I, otherwise I, w- I would spend myself down a rabbit hole of research mm-hmm. before, and the story would never get written. So that's that's so far as the process that's worked for me, but I could I mean I'm not married to it. I could see myself maybe one day getting totally invested in some minor historical detail and then building out from there. Are you more of a plotter or a or a pantser? Because you mentioned with Ruin of a Rake that you started kind of in one direction and then you ended up somewhere else. Um, oh, I'm like a committed plotter. It's just that I'm terrible at it. <laughs> like I, like I plot the hell out of everything that I write. And it's just that I wind up changing it at about, I mean, certainly at the 50% mark. And then, and then like anything, like the whole third act, I'm always wrong, like laughably wrong. I'm yet to write, I'm yet to outline a third act that actually makes it into the book. Um, <laughs> But I need to have a structure, even if it's a wrong structure, I need to have something that I'm following, especially at the beginning when everything is wide open, right? Like you could be writing any story in the world. Like I need to have limitations and, um, and outlining helps me with that. But there's the, the, and then I, then I, but then I retrench. And so it's really the worst process possible because there winds up being, I, for every book, there went up being at least ten thousand words deleted, like and written with, and then replaced with a different ten thousand words, which is um really a crap process. But it's the process I've got, so so here we are. And I don't think you're the only one with that process. Um, yeah, I don't think so either. Like whenever <laughs> I mention it, everyone's like, "Oh yeah, those ten thousand words that we all cut." Like so, I guess, I guess you know, I guess this is standard. 
you know. If you're lucky, you get get away with less, perhaps. But there's usually, you know, a good chapter two or three that just get chucked in favor of something else always. Total garbage, right? Like, just a chapter that is just, like, it's all wrong. All wrong. The thing to do, if you can, is to just repackage those and call it, like, you know, bonus material. <laughs> like, here's the deleted scene. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> like, um, mm-hmm. I, I do save them. Like, I save the words as if I'm ever going to have an opportunity to reuse them like that will never happen, but I save them. Oh, so, absolutely. You know, I can't bear myself to totally delete them from the world. <laughs> Cause yeah, they were important once and you know, maybe again, maybe. Right. You know, who knows? <laughs> Could happen. Now, how much do you try to stay historically accurate versus fictionalizing? So like this is, like, this is a sticky issue. Like, I'd say that I write an optimistic version of the past, but the stories that I write could have happened. It's just that I'm not writing, I'm not writing worst case scenarios. I'm writing best case scenarios. So, so everybody has, every character I have has somebody they can be open and honest with. And that is not something that necessarily would have been average or typical for queer people in 1815. Mm -hmm. However, it's not out of the realm of possibility, you know, like all those people who burnt their loved ones letters after they were dead, like they knew why to burn those letters, you know, like they knew, they knew that there was, that there was like a secret life and all of that. So I'm working with an, with an optimistic, hopeful version of human nature. But, and I don't, and I try not to write anything that couldn't have happened. Sometimes I get that wrong, but that's not intentional, right? Um, But, and like sometimes, and sometimes I do put words in my character's mouth in a way that wouldn't have been possible in 1815. But like, we all do that, you know? Mm -hmm. We, like that's, I think, typical for, historical fiction in general like we're not trying to necessarily replicate a novel that could have been written in 1815 um and then there's things like like um i really don't like the word pantaloons <laughs> like it just really un- it just i find it really unappealing so even though my characters would have been wearing pantaloons like i'm not i will not acknowledge that <laughs> <You know? laughs> so they're in either trousers or britches and that's just the way it's going to be. <laughs> so, which, which I know probably annoys some people, but I, I have not yet gotten that email. <laughs> so I guess it's okay. Well, maybe now, you, now that you're saying it, you're just short circuiting ever getting it in the first place. <laughs> right. I just, it's just not happening. No panelins, hard ban on panelins. <laughs> <laughs> now the first two books, are already out on audio. Uh, Soldier yeah. Scoundrel's been out for a while, and Lawrence Brown Affair, I believe, came out in June. Yes. Um, you've got a terrific narrator with Gary Furlong. Um, he's, he's awesome. It's ridiculous. <laughs> um, when we were when we were listening to the, um, like, you know, like, they send you samples. Like, when, you, when you're looking for an audiobook narrator, they send you samples where they read, um, usually, a scene. And... Everybody was great, but then we get to Gary for a long and we were like, oh my God, you know, like, the, like he was, he was and is amazing. Um, and so he's been a, a delight and like as totally awkward and bad as it is to listen to, to listen to someone reading your words out loud with Gary for, for a long, it is a delight. Um, and also, I'm an audiobook listener. Like, I am constantly listening to audiobooks. So just the fact that they exist in the first place, like, just the fact that my books are in audio in the first place is beyond awesome to me. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, I, I'm a huge fan of audiobooks. Well, I was going to ask what it's like, you know, having your, not only having your works performed that way, but what you personally thought of them. Because you're right. Some authors love to hear the performance side of their work. And others are like okay, he sounds fine and I'm done listening to that now because I can't. I'm like probably the latter camp. Like he sounds fine. Like this is great, but I can't do this to myself. You know, like I, I can't because I'll, I'll, I don't even like, I don't like to reread anything that I wrote either. Mm. It's just, do it, you see, you see all of the, 
you know, you see the parts that you would have changed. Like people yesterday were screenshotting their favorite bits of Rune and Rune of the Rake to me. And it's really difficult to look at it and say, to look at it without an editor's eye, you know, to look at it and say, that's fine. Because really what I, what I see is I could have said that in with like 20 fewer words and all of that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm not ever going to sit down and listen to an audiobook of mine. It's not going to happen, but I'm delighted that they're out there. And that you really scored with the narrator. Yeah. 100%. Fantastic. Yeah. It's amazing. So you've mentioned, you dropped a few hints about what's coming up next for you. You've mentioned the non-binary book and I believe mm -hmm. something else. Can you, can you get more detailed on what's coming and sure. kind of what the schedule is? I have a lot coming up. Um, so there's going to be a, um, there's a lesbian novella coming out in the fall. Okay. I wrote it about one of the side characters in Soldier Scoundrel. She's the lady's maid who is on the make. And she falls in love with a companion, with like a lady's companion. And um, they steal things and redress wrongs and have fun and fall in love. Um, and that I will almost certainly be self-publishing and it should come out at some point this fall, depending on when I can get my act in gear. And then in December, a new, um, a new male, male Regency series starts. And that is a grumpy sea captain and a vicar. And it's, it's like loosely based on the sound of music and Grantchester, um, which I have no idea if that appeals to like anybody except me and like maybe five other people, but, but, um, but that that's December and it'll be another three book Regency series in like the same, the same general mood as my previous male, male series, you know, mm -hmm. um, just with a different cast of characters and a different set of stories. Uh, and then in the spring, I'm starting another series also with Avon. And the first book is a male non-binary pairing. And then the second book, I think, is going to be straight up like male-female. But with, I mean, there's no possibility that they're both going to be straight. And uh, and then the third one, I have no idea what's going to happen with that. But um, but yeah, so I have two different series coming out with Avon, and then probably some shorts and novellas on the side. Mm -hmm. so, I really love that you play with the uh, with sexuality and gender, and even more so that as we mentioned before, that Avon lets you do that. Yeah, like, mm. and like I never even get the feeling that they're letting me, but like that they're into it, you know, like which is which I don't think this could have happened a few years ago. Mm -hmm. You know, like I don't feel like I feel like like something has happened in the market in the last couple of years where people are where the, where the audience wants to read these stories and the I'm mean, like overwhelmingly response has been positive for like not just for my books but for the idea of queer historicals in general, mm -hmm. which is great and like i just cannot imagine that having really happened five years ago so yay you mentioned f folks like jordan hawk you know who, who yes. you've been reading are there others yes. out there in the for people who want to take a deeper dive on queer historicals that you'd recommend i mean jordan hawk kj charles harper fox like harper po harper fox for sure like i feel like the Brothers of the Wild North Sea and Seven Summer Nights are two of the best. I mean, like, they're the two of the best books I've read, period. You know, like, they're just excellent. Mm -hmm. um, there's, let's see, who else is there? I mean, there's, like, in terms of, there's, there's Sarah Waters, okay, where she's, it's not, She's not really writing romances, but she's writing lesbian love stories, and they tend to have happy endings. Um, but the but the romance isn't the central plot. 
there's another woman whose name I cannot think of, and she writes, she is in medieval, and why is her name escaping me? Um, oh, and Ellen Kushner's Swords Point, for sure. Those are the ones off the top of my head, with, with all apologies to everybody I've forgotten. But it's great to, to hear some of your recommendations. We're familiar with Jordan Hawk, um, and she's been on the show Alex, before. Alex Beecroft is the one who I had forgotten. Alex Beecroft is um, she writes she has she has a couple of awesome historicals, um, but yes, Jordan Hawk is lovely. Like like she writes and she does the thing that I love, where it's characters who are super fond of one another, like they just really are into one another, and like that's like like they're just like baseline good, kind, nice people who respect one another and are into one another. And like, there's no, like, like the, like the drama in the stories doesn't come from deception or anything like that. They Mm -hmm. just like, it's lovely to see people who are good and fond of one another. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Especially in this day and age, it makes a right. comfort read out of it, you know. It is. It's totally. A co- there's, I mean, there's monsters and like some of them stick to my stomach, you know. <laughs> but, but like it's totally a, it, like yes, comfort reads exactly. So, what's the best way for folks to keep up with you online and 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 all your books? I sort of. I mean, like I, anyone who's on Twitter, like I kind of live on Twitter because I work from home and like it's nice to interact with humans. Um, so Twitter for sure, but my website, which is catsebastian.com, has a sign up thing for my newsletter, which that's probably like anyone who's interested in new releases can either pay attention to my website or sign up for the newsletter. Fantastic. I'm on Facebook too. I'm on Facebook too, but as little as possible, to be totally honest. <laughs> That seems to be a trend these days. So yeah, I I get that. I I mean, like people like it. And so I try really hard, but I feel like I feel, I feel much more comfortable on Twitter. So we will link up to all that um, in our show notes so that people can find you. Awesome. Kat, it's been so amazing talking to you and and getting to know a little bit more about your books and stuff. Yeah, this has been lovely. Thank you so much. In Somewhere on Mackinac by Jeff Adams, Jordan Monroe travels to Mackinac Island for the Somewhere in Time fan celebration weekend. Once there, he becomes attracted to local stable owner Miles Coulter. When Jordan learns the stable's in trouble, he wants to help despite Miles' resistance. As their relationship grows, he dreads the issues that face them. Can they forge a love as timeless as the romance in their favorite film? Find out in Somewhere on Mackinac by Jeff Adams. Available from DreamSpinnerPress.com, Amazon.com, and other ebook retailers. Well, I think that'll do it for this week's episode. Coming up in episode number 93, the GRL blog tour continues with Christina Piltz, plus Joyfully Jay will be here with some reading recommendations. Yeah, it was fun talking to Christina, which I actually recorded in the past week. Uh, She also writes in historical time periods, and it was fun to hear that her uh, kicking off point was reading uh, Laura Ingalls Wilder in, uh, in, in school back in the day. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, it was fun. Cool. We'll look forward to that. So, um, just remember that no matter where life takes you, the journey will always be sweeter if you have a book. So until next time, guys, keep reading. For detailed show notes and the complete episode backlist, go to BigGayFictionPodcast.com. New episodes are available every Monday on all major podcast distributors and YouTube. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. 